focuses on social ecological systems. Um, so I guess apologies in advance if there are questions I'm unable to answer, but I will endeavour to chase up um, after, after the talk. So let's see whether this magic's going to work. Do you reckon I can advance? No, it doesn't look like it. No. No, I think somebody did that for me. Yep, so could you go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Mwanina people as the uh, traditional owners of this land and sea country and the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the ongoing custodians. Um, and also given that the theme of this presentation is on um, climate change and Southern Ocean ecosystems, I'd like to recognise the vast and continuing cultural knowledge um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people stretching back over tens of thousands of years of changes in climate um, and also the connection of Southern Ocean ecosystems to ocean, ocean and coastal environments in Australia, uh, particularly through the seasonal migration of birds and whales. Next slide, please. Let's see if I can make a bit of room for my notes here so I'm not... There we go, that's a bit better. Um, so this morning I'm speaking about the underpinning role of biodiversity data for large-scale ecosystem assessment. Um, so I'll start with the reasons and approach for undertaking ecosystem assessment in the Southern Ocean. Next slide, please. Southern Ocean ecosystems are globally important. Um, they support a range of ecosystem services, which we classify as supporting services, um, so primary production and nutrient cycling, uh, regulating services, notably the role of ecosystems in climate regulation. Um, they support important and valuable fisheries, as well as other provisioning services, um, such as genetic resources. And they also support cultural services such as uh, tourism, education and science and cultural connection. The Southern Ocean itself um, is also central um, to global ocean circulation and to climate regulation within the Earth system. So it's a hotspot for the transfer of heat and carbon between the atmosphere and the vast interiors of the ocean. Uh, in fact, the Southern Ocean has taken up around 75% um, of anthropogenic heat and 43% of anthropogenic carbon dioxide um, absorbed by the global ocean since the Industrial Revolution. The richness in nutrients uh, of the deep ocean waters that upwell in the Southern Ocean makes um, the seas around Antarctica some of the most productive on the planet. And since all the nutrients um, aren't um, completely consumed by regional primary production, um, before they head northward, the, the Southern Ocean also functions as a, a hub of new changes in Antarctic ecosystems. So if you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll see those poor little penguins. Um, and again, next slide, please. So ocean warming is driving other changes in uh, southern Ocean habitats beyond just sea ice and this figure is showing where Southern Ocean ecosystems are experiencing underlying changes um, that are impacting the system overall. So the, the vertical arrows show the depth to which these effects extend and there's a couple of arrows there with slightly lighter shading for species turnover um, and also pollution and that indicates um, that while there's an expectation that these have occurred at deeper depths, um, there's no direct observations currently available. And then the maps along the bottom uh, show the circumpolar occurrence of these changes to date. So minimal occurrence is, is light blue, um, moderate occurrence is orange and high occurrence is uh, red. So in terms of climate change, ocean warming due to greenhouse gas emissions has effects that extend across all depths of the ocean and to date have been concentrated in um, the Atlantic center, uh, sector over um, to the left there. Um, and there are cascading effects for habitats which also include things like ice shelf loss, um, glacier retreat, sea ice loss that we've talked about um, and flow on effects for habitats. 
Um, the Southern Ocean is also freshening um, and it's becoming windier. It's particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification also, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. Uh, next slide, please. There are also a, a range of um, local drivers of change in Southern Ocean ecosystems, which include uh, marine derived pollution from vessels, uh, land derived pollution from scientific uh, research stations and also from tourism, uh, establishment of non-Indigenous species, the direct impacts of tourism and visitation. Uh, we're seeing recovery of marine mammals in the Southern Ocean after the cessation of uh, sealing and whaling, um, which does have implications for uh, ecosystem processes, and then also um, fishing and coastal concentrated coastal changes that are mostly driven by um, breakup of ice shelves and associated iceberg scouring. Next slide, please. So the need to um, assess these changes so that managers and decision makers can respond in a timely and sustainable manner has been the motivation for the International MESO program, which stands for, not the SOUP, uh, the Marine Ecosystem Assessment for the Southern Ocean. And here we are all back at the beginning uh, in 2018 at the inaugural MESO conference in Hobart. Uh, MESO has been a core program of the regional program ICED, Integrating Climate and Ecosystem Dynamics of the Global IMBA program. And it's also supported by SCAR, the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, uh, SCORE and SUS, the Southern Ocean Observing System. Uh, next topic, please. Uh, next slide. So MESO is the first circumpolar assessment of Southern Ocean ecosystem status and trends. It's a spatially structured assessment. And it's been a five-year international program of over 200 scientists providing a forward-looking assessment of trends in Southern Ocean ecosystems. Um, you can see there on the right um, a map uh, of the number of authors by continent. We've endeavoured to ensure that the program has been inclusive. There's been a high level of early career researcher involvement and leadership um, and also a good uh, gender balance. 50% of authors identify as women. Um, and we have 25 papers in a frontiers research topic um, with uh, over 200,000 views so far. Next slide, please. So uh, um, at its workshop in uh, Woking in the UK in 2019, the MESO participants agreed to establish areas for assessing how ecosystem attributes vary around Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, and also for assessing dynamics and change. Um, so the, these areas were intended to reflect regions within which the dynamics of sea ice, ocean and benthic habitats um, combined remained reasonably similar across the region. Um, the areas are similar to areas that are designed for particular disciplines like oceanography um, and for the management of fisheries in Kamala the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, um, but they don't match exactly because the intention in MESO is to reflect ecological and ecosystem properties, so across many disciplines um, within an area. Um, and they're also larger than the areas designed to coordinate field research activities across nations. Um, so here's the map of the MESO areas. They're determined by a combination of five sectors, which are the main colours and three zones, which are the, um, the different shadings. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the scope of the MESO assessment and some bonus pictures of penguins, um, whales and seals. I actually fell through the ice next to this minky whale in East Antarctica. It's cold. Um, so, you, so MESO provides the first assessment of status and trends for habitats and the drivers of habitat change are shown as icons on the left, um, species and food webs, and we have the, um, the central icons with colours denoting the two main pathways of energy flow in Southern Ocean food webs through Antarctic krill uh, in orange um, and uh, through fish in blue. Um, and then we also show here, if you can make it out, the species that are currently recovering um, from harvesting. They have an, a solid outline. Uh, and then also ecosystem services on the right. 
Um, at the top are example observation platforms um, delivering data to underpin um, assessments and then the modelling and assessment process is shown at the bottom which in turn informs decisions made around conservation, resilience and sustainability. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through the features of um, biodiversity data that are available to support Southern Ocean Ecosystem Assessment. Um, this is a historical timeline of data gathering and data systems that can underpin Southern Ocean Ecosystem Assessment. Um, the details are obviously uh, far too small to read here, but I just wanted to put into context the very long history stretching back to 1770 of scientific observation in the Southern Ocean. Um, and also in relation to the establishment of Southern Ocean data systems, which um, are at the bottom um, in, in blue, uh, and most notably the SCAR Antarctic Biodiversity Portal, which began just over a decade ago. Next slide, please. So this map shows um, time series of human observations sourced from GBIF and OBIS um, for each meso area. Uh, the y-axis on each of these panels is the number of records per square kilometre. Uh, and the number of human observation records per unit area is highest and has increased the most in recent years um, in the subantarctic zone of the central Indian sector, which is the, the medium yellow there. Um, in the Antarctic zone of the East Pacific sector, so close to the Antarctic Peninsula in bright pink, um, and the Antarctic and northern zones of the East Indian sector, which are the um, two darker shades of green at the bottom there. So I guess the key point here is that um, unsurprisingly for a region that is as hard to access as the Southern Ocean, the availability of biodiversity data is spatially variable, um, with some regions much better sampled than others. So next slide, thanks. Sticking with human observations, overall pelagic species are better sampled than benthic species um, with a higher percentage of records on the top left and higher spatial coverage on the top right. Uh, birds and mammals are by far um, the most sampled group followed by um, crustaceans and birds and mammals and crustaceans also um, are the groups with the best spatial coverage. Um, but there are some groups which have relatively low sampling but good spatial coverage. So some examples there are mollusks, uh, gelatinous zooplankton and annelids. Next slide, please. This is the evolution of the number of records um, through time across phyla. Um, and interestingly here, proteobacteria um, were absent from the database um, databases until the decade from 1980 to 1989, but we've seen a very marked increase continuing in the last decade of this time series. Next slide, thanks. So the top panel here is an overall time series of the number of records for human and machine observations with some key expeditions highlighted, the um, discovery investigations, the biological investigations of marine Antarctic Systems and Stocks, which is the biomass survey, um, the Southern Ocean Continuous Plankton Recorder surveys and the Census of Antarctic Marine Life. Uh, and then in the bottom two panels, you can see um, a consistent seasonal bias, uh, particularly for human observations, where we have higher sampling intensity during the austral summer months for obvious reasons. Um, and there's a, it's a little bit hard to make out, there's a peak in human observations in May in the last decade that's dominated by what um, seems to be a single campaign collecting and analysing environmental DNA in 2016. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, molecular data has only started to represent a significant amount of um, data for the Southern Ocean um, in these databases since 2010. Um, and you can see... Uh, on the top left, um, as you, yeah, so so more recent, but and with um, the four dominant phyla all being mi um, microorganisms. Uh, currently, um, spatially 
patchy availability, but it seems that molecular data will be increasingly important in supporting ecosystem assessment. Um, and, and we think that in this context in the future it will be important to move away from sampling to support species distribution modelling, at least for the Southern Ocean, because of um, these models are very coarse in terms of ecological understanding, but to be undertaking sampling that helps determine ecological separation of populations and metapopulations. Um, and that can be thought of as the degree of connectivity between locations and the possible recovery times um, if a place is disturbed. Next slide, please. So uh, dietary data has also been important in informing MESO. Um, this figure shows the distribution of dietary data from the SCAR uh, Southern Ocean Dietary Database south of 40 degrees south. Um, the transparent grey dots are the locations of um, diet sample data um, that were used in an analysis of food web structure and then the clusters um, uh, represented by darker shades because of overlaid dots. Next slide, thanks. So these beautiful um, graphics are uh, representations of Southern Ocean food webs for the Atlantic sector in the top left, um, the Indian sector in the top right, the East Pacific in the bottom left and the West Pacific in the bottom right. Um, and Antarctic krill, which are really important species in Southern Ocean ecosystems are shown as the, the black circles there and the black connecting lines. Um, so the point of these figures, including these figures, is really just to highlight that um, dietary relationships in the Southern Ocean are very complex, um, contrary to kind of previous thinking that there were quite simple food chains. Um, and also that the structure of um, food webs in different parts of the Southern Ocean is very different. And understanding these different energy pathways is really central to examining climate change impacts in Southern Ocean ecosystems. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go um, into the meso findings in a lot of detail, but I just have a few slides that summarise findings across some key taxonomic groups and also give you a flavour for um, how we've summarised and presented the results from the assessment. So the drivers of change for krill and zooplankton in the Southern Ocean are quite complex. And this figures an attempt to summarise what's currently known about the level of influence of different drivers um, and the vulnerability of different groups. So just spend a, a brief moment explaining how to interpret the figure. The drivers of change are listed down the left-hand side and the groups are listed across the top. Um, we have the key there on the right showing that um, red is a high level of influence of a driver on a particular group, orange is a medium level, uh, blue is a low level of influence, and that the blue-grey colour shows where there's um, an unknown um, influence or it varies greatly according to species. So the key messages here are that temperature has a high degree of influence on all groups, um, except for copepods for, um, where the effect isn't known, and that sea ice and ocean circulation are also important factors. Um, and population trajectories for zooplankton under future climate change will be determined by the interacting effects of the drivers shown here. Next slide, thanks. For seabirds and marine mammals, there are a range of uh, climate-associated associated drivers that have different effects for different groups and species. Um, again, in this figure, we have the colours showing the nature of the impacts. Red is a negative impact, purple is a mixed impact, blue is a positive impact, and yellow means that there's no effect. Um, and this figure also uses filled circles to indicate confidence levels. Uh, for each impact based on available evidence following the IPCC style for reporting confidence levels. So ocean warming and extreme events have a negative impact for all groups and shifting frontal locations also have negative impacts for species that need to travel further for foraging. If you could advance the next part of the slide, please. Thanks. In terms of sea ice processes, impacts are mixed for flying birds, penguins and seals, given, given the, the varying ways in which different species depend on sea ice habitats. Um, and increased precipitation has a negative impact for penguins. 
And finally, um, if you can put up the last bit, please. Um, in this table, we also looked at the impacts of fisheries interactions for marine mammals and birds. And that's been a core part of me. So the um, examination of um, fisheries trends and impacts. Um, and just to highlight here that the yellow square indicates no change for the impact of um, krill fishing on, on seabirds, but a negative impact for penguins. Next slide, please. Um, as I said at the beginning, the Southern Ocean is particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification because of the effect of temperature on carbonate chemistry. Um, ocean acidification is affecting ecosystems at all depths, but organisms at deeper depths are particularly vulnerable because of the effects of both temperature and pressure on the dissolution of calcium carbonate. Um, so the effect of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and consequent uptake by the oceans is that the aragonite um, saturation horizon is shallowing. So the depth range suitable for calcification is shrinking and will continue to shrink. Um, aragonite under saturation in surface waters has already been observed in a number of Southern Ocean regions and expect, it's expected to become more widespread and impact uh, Southern Ocean ecosystem components and processes increasingly over coming decades. Um, and benthic calcifying species are particularly vulnerable, but also um, pelagic groups like coccolithophores, uh, foraminiferans and pteropods. I can't actually tell how I'm going for time. I think I'm okay. <laughs> okay. So next slide, please. Thanks. This figure summarises um, change in benthic ecosystems. So moving anti-clockwise from the top left, we have increases in ocean temperature um, leading to fewer low temperature adapted species and an increase in um, invasive crab abundance. Decreases in sea ice uh, leading to more opportunists and fewer specialised suspension feeders. Increases in iceberg scouring, meaning more fast growing species and more mobile species. Uh, as I've just said, ocean acidification leading to fewer species with um, the, a calcifying um, and fishery pressure um, meaning fewer um, slow-growing species and sponges, particularly where there's been thick disturbance from fishing activities. Next slide, thanks. <coughs> So the, the MESO assessment also included cultural connections to Southern Ocean ecosystems um, and it's resulted in this interactive database of stories and cultural connection. Um, and we think that understanding cultural connection and how it's expressed in stories and cultural art forms um, and it, as well as how it's changed over time is is incredibly important in helping to inform policy and decision making for uh, the protection of Southern Ocean ecosystems. Next slide, please. Um, so our MISO summary for policymakers is being sent to the printers as we speak. Um, it will be officially launched in Hobart next month. Um, and more generally, some examples of the impact and uptake of MISO to date include um, its role in underpinning assessments for the latest IPCC assessment report from Working Group 2. Um, we've given presentations at both the um, COP26 and COP27 meetings in Glasgow and Egypt. Um, and MISO has also contributed to a recent workshop on climate change held by the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And I've particularly acknowledged here the two other MISO co-conveners, uh, Andrew Constable, who's based in Hobart, and Monica Mulbert in Brazil. Next slide, please. So our key findings for policy from MESO are that the Southern Ocean and its ecosystems play critical roles in the climate system and these ecosystem functions are at risk because of anthropogenic climate change. Next point, please. Actually, just whack them all up and then I can... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, climate change is the most significant driver of species and ecosystem change in the Southern Ocean and coastal Antarctica. Um, and direct human interventions at sufficient scale to reduce sensitivity and exposure of cold and sea ice adapted species to the impacts of climate change are 
um, unavailable at present, which means that climate change mitigation is currently um, the only option for reducing the impacts. Um, actions are also needed to ensure that local and regional human activities don't impact the resilience of these species and systems and to reduce the risk of Southern Ocean ecosystems transitioning into alternative states from which recovery couldn't be achieved. And finally, long-term maintenance of Southern Ocean ecosystems, particularly polar adapted Antarctic species and coastal systems, can only be achieved with high confidence in the long term by curbing climate change and ocean acidification through greenhouse gas emission reduction. Next slide, please. We'll have all these points too, thanks. Um, in terms of our recommendations for ongoing measurement and assessment for Southern Ocean ecosystems, um, directly measuring the state of Southern Ocean ecosystems is really central to assessment. Uh, new approaches and greater and more sustained investment than at present is requir required for covering the complexity of food webs, diverse communities and the large extent and remoteness of the region. A uh, greater geographic spread of ongoing comprehensive long-term ecosystem studies is needed to assess spatial and seasonal variability for establishing trends in ecosystem structure and function. Systematic and sustained long-term measurement of habitats and biota are needed to underpin assessments of ecosystem change. Um, and finally, assessments of change will be facilitated by archiving, curating and openly sharing data algorithms and tools based on FAIR principles. Next slide, please. Um, so I've presented results from the, the first um, marine ecosystem assessment for the Southern Ocean, but we anticipate and hope that this will be an activity that's repeated at regular intervals. Um, and this figure is a conceptual representation of the different components of an integrated system of marine biological observations and informatics that are compatible with global systems, but also address the specific properties of the Southern Ocean. Um, so it's centered around essential variables and linked to the FAIR principles in red and the IPY, uh, International Polar Year Data Vision in purple. So the intention is that, um, sorry, can I wasn't quite finished. Thank you. Um, the intention is that this system can build on existing platforms and standards and add to them where needed, but also enable the inclusion of new methods and ideas. And, it, and obviously it also needs to be transparent and traceable um, and based on a minimum set of um, variables measured using comparable methods across space and time. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to finish up with uh, a really beautiful graphic that was um, developed by the talented Eve Brennan for one of the presentations I mentioned that we gave to the uh, COP meeting in Glasgow. Um, and the story tells how the Antarctic and Southern Ocean is an ecosystem of global significance as a heat and carbon sink, that it's a place that captures the imagination of people around the world and supports fisheries and tourism. If you could pop up the next bit, please. Um, the Antarctic is a key part of global ocean circulation where carbon and nutrients sink to the bottom of the ocean and travel around the world. Next bit, thanks. Phytoplankton and krill form the ecosystem foundation for predators that travel from the equator or live on sea ice where bottom dwellers evolved in freezing waters and need them to remain cold. This is a giant sea spider and a sponge, if that needed clarifying. Next bit, thank you. So right now the Southern Ocean needs climate change mitigation to continue the ecosystem processes that everybody needs. Next slide, thanks. So we can consider two possible futures for the Southern Ocean ecosystem. Um, by limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, we can preserve and maintain the key things we care about and depend on from the Southern Ocean. Beyond that level, our current scientific understanding is that ecosystem services will be degraded and that we may lose elements of the system. Uh, loss of sea ice will have cascading effects for key species, food webs and ecosystem services. And at two degrees of warming, the risks are very high and it's unclear whether recovery would ever be possible. 
um, thank you for bearing with me through the minor technical glitches. And again, thank you so much for the invitation to present as part of the conference. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I was trying to work out how to put this into the app, but I couldn't. I couldn't determine it. Um, given the things that are plausible and possible, uh, if investment was available to put more uh, to collect more data on biodiversity in the Antarctic region, what are the types of data and the approaches that you'd find most useful to improve your recommendations? Mm. Great question. <laughs> um, and we do go into some more detail on that in, in this the summary for policy makers that I mentioned. I'm happy to share the link around what, once that's available. Um, I guess some, some key elements that I touched on are the, the need to be sampling um, agreed essential variables um, and we're coming close to uh, an agreed set there. Um, addressing the, the seasonal data gap I think will be a very important thing and more investment in in more sustained and um, geographically even sampling. Um, the zooplankton, the lower trophic levels, um, there's a, very complex in terms of untangling the drivers. So while well, we have some really great records for zooplankton from things like the, the CPR record, um, I think um, filling the gaps that we have there in terms of the changes in the, the zooplankton will be important. And then finally, I mentioned the capacity to untangle these different uh, pathways for energy flow through the krill-based food web and the fish-based food web. And we expect that potentially um, the implications of warming and acidification for krill versus um, copepods, which are the source of food for many of the mesopelagic fish, may mean that that fish pathway is more important. And so data gathering, I think, that can help us untangle when and where we're seeing that transition in energy flow will be very important as well. Is that helpful? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. This is very, very cool. Um, uh, how realistic it is to use data density maps and the, and the, uh, to plan future routes for the cruises? Is it is it at all possible to to imagine that? Um, the map of the best available data we have now will actually inform a future exploration to cover those gaps with it, with actual new data, not extrapolations. And the second uh, uh, question, or like comment to the whole Tadwick, uh, this Tadwick, we don't have anything on data interactions as far as I know. I wrote to Antonio Sariva, and we have an interest group on interactions data. You mentioned food webs, and the interaction data are probably uh, one of the most most difficult types uh, to store and manage in the databases. So um, maybe we could form a, a little group of interested people about that to compensate for the lack of interaction session in this conference. I would be in particular interested to know how you handle the food web related data for the beautiful graphs you're showing. Thank you. Both um, excellent questions that push me slightly outside my comfort zone into the data space, but I agree that the density maps would be really helpful. Some of that, a little bit of that work has been done. Um, a challenge which probably applies to other um, contexts here is that um, the um, fishery vessel derived data is another important source, so it's putting it all together in a way that we can more meaningfully identify those actual gaps. But yes, I think that's a really useful suggestion. And also, yes, very interested in any discussions around the interactions data, which um, yeah, and I can share the um, the underpinning work for those food web figures if that's useful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all of those recommendations that you have in the report, they're all basically about more data. How much data is enough, do we think, for the for us to start converting those into actions and what's the response to sort of from policymakers about that are they uh, i mean i know you haven't published the report yet but is that what, what's their sort of perspective on that next stage yeah that, that's a really important point and particularly in relation to the way that um camla for instance the the um, fisheries and conservation management body for the southern ocean can respond um we've 
very clear in the messaging from both MISO and, and in other contexts that there is actually enough information um, already available to be developing strategies to respond to climate change. The lack of data has been used previously as a reason not to take action. So I agree, you know, there's an important trade-off there in messaging around having enough information to take action, but needing more information, I guess, particularly to identify where we might be approaching those critical t transitions I talked about. So tipping points, for instance, um, are a potential risk for the, well, they're a real risk for, for the Southern Ocean, both in terms of the habitats and species and assemblages. So um, more data that can be more targeted, I guess, to help us untangle which trajectory that we're on um, and that is integrated with the modelling systems that can provide us with that forward-looking lens as well. Does, uh, does that answer that? Yeah. So I noticed in your data that the effects on copepods were undetermined. Um, <clears throat> I would interpret that as the, the copepod category is too coarse. Is, is that how you would interpret that as well? And, and if so, what would an appropriate taxonomic resolution be for that? That might be one that I agree. I might have to take it on notice and go to our resident um, copepod expert. Um, and I'm very happy to... Yeah, get back to you on that one. Mm. There's a question online, Shelley, I think. Probably small versus large is important in terms of the um, the food sources, so the diet, you know, whether they're feeding on diatoms or some of the smaller phytoplankton or um, other zooplankton. But mm. Since I've got the mic, uh, the question online is, you had graphs comparing human-gathered observations and machine-gathered observations. Not surprisingly, there was a large difference in winter. What are the most common sources of machine-gathered observations? I'm unable to give a definitive answer there, um, but I believe some of the increase for the winter months is related, for instance, to the um, sensors that are employed on um, uh, seals particularly, um, as well as some of the, the um, biological sensors on Argo floats, for instance. But beyond that, apologies, that's another one I might have to um, take on notice. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really enjoy your presentation. <laughs> um, I have two questions. So I'm a data manager from Scott and Talk to Biodiversity Portal. <laughs> nice meeting you. So my question is, what are the information that I could encourage the data provider to provide that could enhance the MISO analysis. The second question is, what are the inf is there any information that you could not find for the analysis because it doesn't fit into the Darwin Core standard, for example? Thank you. Great. It sounds uh, maybe that we should have a, a, a longer discussion around that um, after the talk, but um, yeah, I, I might have to think about that in terms of the the suggestions. I think sometimes there's um, it's not so much the uh, the continuity in terms of the data availability, but it's more the translation of the findings from the analysis of the data to the policymakers where the gap is. Actually, that's my sense. Um, but yeah, I think. I wonder whether, you know, I talked a little bit about molecular data and whether there's some challenges there in terms of thinking about how that's made available. But, yeah, it would be good to have, really good to have a conversation. Thanks. Is there anyone down in Antarctica, way down here, who would like to ask something? No, it's apparently too cold down there. <laughs> Going, going. Oh, well, excellent. Amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, our company, Xylo Systems, provides useful data for businesses that are impacting the environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously, there's lots of businesses, fisheries, uh, tourism operating in the Antarctic. They do want to do good and they do want to mitigate their impact. How do you see providing this type of data and information in a useful manner for businesses to understand and mitigate their impacts? Yeah, fantastic question and a really interesting topic, actually, one where I think there's 
a lot of space to think about different ways to deliver information. And that's partly why for different audiences we've started using some of those kind of more narrative examples um, like the comics that I showed. Um, and I guess another interesting point too is that, you know, there's a strong interest um, from philanthropists too in investing to minimise um, well, better understand impacts on Antarctic ecosystems and, and improve sustainability outcomes in terms of presence. Um, so there's a very long way around of saying perhaps it's something to explore depending on the particular business um, or audience, but um, and there may be some good examples already for the Antarctic Peninsula region, which is kind of the hot spot for tourism. But um, I don't have a clear answer for you, but I think it's a really important topic. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, really nice talk. Um, I just get curious because on one slide you showed that you had like really high abundance of proteobacteria, and I was wondering, oh wow, that's uh, cool. Uh, where does that is coming from? I, d I don't know. <laughs> okay. No I should, worries. I should have prepared no. before I pointed it out. But yes, it is interesting. Oh, okay. no, I, I feel like I'm probably the only one microbiologist over like, oh, wow, bacteria yeah. out there. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, please, please join me in thanking Jess once again. Fabulous talk, thank you. All right, um, all right, moving right along.